the nature of power and, and what our policymakers must have to implement what they want in terms of monetary policy, we're not moving towards decentralization. As appealing as that may be, we're moving towards greater centralization and a loss of freedom. I'd like to welcome everyone to Freedom Feature, and I'm Barry Bussey. Today, our special guest is David McIlvaney, and David is the host of McIlvaney Weekly Commentary, which has the objective to provide investors with valuable monetary, economic, geopolitical, and financial information that cannot be found on Wall Street. And it seeks to look deeper and analyze more extensively and ask better questions. It is our pleasure to have Mr. McIlvaney with us to discuss how issues of finance affect freedom. Mr. McIlvaney, welcome to our program today. Barry, it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for the invitation. I look forward to our conversation. Well, this is great. I, I tell you, uh, you come very highly recommended. A lot of people who uh, are interested in freedom here in Canada say, hey, listen, we got to have David on here and uh, just uh, discuss about the importance of of finances and its relationship with freedom. And I'm just wondering if you could just share with our listeners who you are and what you do. Yeah, I'll share a little bit personally, but also to put that in context with our family. Um, I get to participate in quite a tradition, a second generation, uh, both in a family business, but also with this idea of educating and helping people gain a context for the decisions that they make. Um, my father started our business 50 years ago and looks at precious metals and asset management through a very different lens. And freedom is certainly a part of that. If you look at the tradition of gold as sound money, it's something that enables agency and has through time. And, and is one of the things that has, if you look at the history of money and, and the history of government has been key towards individuals maintaining some autonomy uh, from autocracy. And so I, I love the fact that starting almost 45 years ago, my father started publishing a newsletter dealing with these issues to bring into the mind the, the consciousness of, of the investing public, the important issues of the day, and, and perhaps their considerations and actions that they could take. My background, I studied philosophy at Biola University and political philosophy at Oxford University. And my business interests really began after that uh, in, in, in the short stint with the Acton Institute and the Institute for Liberty and Development in Santiago, uh, Chile, a, a free market economic think tank that, that looked at how the free markets could bring um, positive change to, to, to society. And, and so they did a number of studies to, to look at how free market ideas, even in the context of, of public schools and, and, and public policy in general, uh, would would be fruitful. Mm. So I've participated in our family business now since 2003. We have two separate businesses. One is is the metals brokerage business. We helped gold uh, become legalized again in 1975. We found a religious exemption that allowed us to be bullion dealers um, three years before gold was actually legalized. Wow. And so we had sort of a first mover advantage providing gold on a wholesale basis to Wall Street firms. Um, so we still have the metals brokerage business. We also have the asset management business, which focuses on hard assets, infrastructure, real estate, global natural resources, precious metals, things of that nature. So this keeps us busy. You mentioned the podcast or the, the weekly commentary. Uh, that's now in its 15th year mm -hmm. and something that we do each week as a routine discipline to look at the markets. And when we find questions that we're unable to answer, we bring in experts from the central bank community, academics globally, uh, or particular experts in a field uh, where they bring insight. Many of these people are people we don't agree with, but still bring some facet of, of, of insight uh, that we wouldn't have otherwise. So yeah. this is what keeps us busy. This is what we love. Well, that's awesome. And I like the fact that you're willing to talk to people you may not necessarily agree with on everything, because I think that's important, it seems to me, when it comes to freedom. And that's one of the things we try to do here at First Freedoms. The note that you just said about the idea of getting a religious exemption to own gold, that just sparks me. I got to ask you on that. How did that happen? Yeah. So back in 1933, we needed to devalue 
needed. I use that word loosely, but FDR determined that the best course forward in the context of the Great Depression was to be able to print more money. Okay. You couldn't print more money as long as there was a one-to-one -one relationship with the dollar and gold. So to maintain legitimacy with our foreign creditors, we maintained the gold standard, but we made it illegal to own it and trade it domestically, which allowed for him to inflate the money supply increase the amount of money in circulation. And that was the method proposed, sort of the Keynesian methodology proposed to, to solve our, our financial crisis there in the 1930s in the Great Depression. Mm. So we devalued our currency by 65% overnight, and it was now illegal to own gold with a 10-year jail sentence and a $10,000 fine, which back in the day was a lot of money. Wow. And so that, that was law the law of the land until January 1st, 1975. My father and uh, two other gentlemen uh, worked with Senator Jesse Helms' office here in the United States to change the legislation and allow for gold to be legalized again. But in that interim period, 1933 to 1975, you could own something that has a, a religious uh, theme to it. And I think the original concept was if you had a gold cross or uh, perhaps uh, you know the Star of David or something religious in nature, then you could own physical metals. Otherwise, it didn't work. So we found someone who would make one and two ounce gold medallions, 24 karat gold medallions that had religious themes. So uh, Jesus feeding the 5,000 or Noah's Ark, or you know whether it was the Old Testament or New Testament, it, it didn't matter. If it had a religious theme, we could now be owners of gold bullion and, and meet that exemption. Well, that's fascinating about just the, the whole idea of controlling the, the bullion market. And that's something that we may want to just kind of have a look at as we go in our conversation. And so today we're wanting to just look at the concept of money. And, you know, when I think of money, I think of something that I can do with it, right? I can take my money, I can go uh, buy a car, I can sell my car, I can, uh, you know, uh, use cash, I can use my credit card, all the rest of it. And as long as I have lots of it, I have lots of freedom, it seems to me, to engage in commerce. And what is it? Uh, I wonder, how can we maximize our freedom when it comes to controlling our own money? The basic idea of money is that there's this thing, which is a, a medium of exchange, which you described, mm -hmm. uh, a store of value. And of course, to, 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 to reach these criteria, you have to have divisibility. You know, why don't we use diamonds? Very hard to divide. You can't put them back together once you've broken them apart. So, so through time, we've come up with concepts of what works better, one thing better than the other. So trial and error, we decided that shells would not work. We decided that a variety of, of, of feathers or notched sticks, I mean, the, the experiments have gone on and on through time. We landed on gold and silver, something that was very valuable, hard to get, represented sort of a concentrated form of wealth and had those, those basic qualities, a medium of exchange, a store of value, et cetera. Today, you could say, well, we can do that in so many different forms. We can do that with paper money. We can even do that with new digital forms of money. And that's becoming very popular to, to, to think about, not only with cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum and, and, and many, many others. There's you know 1,500, there'll be thousands and thousands more as time goes on. And, and there's this idea that a decentralized system is better than a centralized system. So cryptocurrencies have appealed to a very freedom-oriented group of people, but there are some problems there as well. So benefits and problematic elements too, as it relates to digital currencies. One of the things that we will see and already have seen, the hat has been tipped by centralized monetary authorities, the Federal Reserve, the Bank of Canada, the People's Bank of China, the Bank of Japan, the European Central Bank, is that they too have noticed that there are some valuable aspects to digital currencies that they may want to harness as well. And one thing is very clear, they're not interested in losing their monopoly on, on the creation and distribution of money, the control of the money supply, just like we talked about earlier. 1933, the, the illegal that the legalization or illegal you know holding of gold back in 1933 here in the United States had to do with control of the monetary levers so that they could have greater influence and control it was believed over the economy 
Mm. So, so what makes us think that we are going to migrate towards decentralized digital currencies and have our monetary authorities walk away from the benefits of control? And centralization. And, and I think this is one of the great things, perhaps a source of naivete within the marketplace as to the nature of money and the nature of control and what is at stake if you consider you know, the benefits of, again, decentralized things like Bitcoin, Ethereum, et cetera, et cetera, versus central, centralized digital currencies, central bank digital currencies. When it comes to control um, for the government agencies, these banks, any thought on on how they would uh, harness this uh, decentralization, like with Bitcoin and all the rest? How, because the, I, I thought in theory it was the whole idea that no government can't touch this, but and and we we saw a little bit of this, I think, uh, here in Canada, and we'll talk about this later. But government made it very clear that uh, when you support protesters whom they didn't like, uh, they were going after the cryptocurrencies as well. I don't know how they did it, but... Yeah, yeah the, the idea of a, of, a, of, a, of a decentralized ledger where you've got multiple nodes, and if you don't control all of the nodes or a majority of the nodes, um, that, that you can't actually access, control, shut down, um, eliminate, seize, what have you, there's, there's, I think, a little bit of a misconception there. And I think maybe the best example of this is in 2021, we had um, a pipeline here in the U.S. Um, and, and, and some hackers basically shut down this natural gas pipeline and demanded payment in Bitcoin. And it was, it was only weeks later that the U.S. government was seizing that Bitcoin. Well, how, how does that happen? If it's if it's an asset that is outside of a system that be that can be controlled, mm. so I mean I understand it, it what it is as advertised, but if there's anything that we can learn from the 2021 pipeline debacle, it is that there's greater access and perhaps backdoor access that we're not really um, in tune with, right. but governments understand full well, and 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 so there there may not be as much freedom as is advertised through your decentralized digital currencies. What I see as somewhat dystopian is the centralization of digital currencies because there's, there's a concept amongst economists, which, which is, this is a very, very important policy tool for policymakers and economists understand this well. When you've got a system that has lots and lots of debt you can make the burden of that debt go away if you increase the currency in circulation. This is what we know is inflation. So inflate away the burden of debt. But there is another policy choice when you're between a rock and a hard place. Uh, you can assign who is going to win and who is going to lose. This came to the surface in a conversation I had with Carmen Reinhardt on our commentary many years ago. Um, Carmen Reithard has, has been an excellent academic at, at Harvard for years. Uh, I think she's chief economist now at either the IMF or the World Bank. I forget, one of the two mm -hmm. um, currently. And we talked about the, the idea of, of financial repression. And, and financial repression is, is this basic idea of, of holding interest rates artificially low so that you benefit some financial actors at the expense of others. So, so, for instance, if, if I'm the federal government, in the U.S., we carry about $30 trillion in debt, not a small sum, not an insignificant amount. Well, it's very easy for me to manage $30 trillion in debt if I can define what my rate of interest is. How much is it going to cost me to maintain that debt? Right. If it's zero, if it's less than zero, the benefit accrues to me, and who's that at the expense of? Well, if I've artificially suppressed interest rates, it means that your 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 bank depositor, uh, your saver, someone who's living on a fixed income and and requires some cash flow from from an investment in bonds or a fixed income portfolio, they're going to suffer from less income, even while the benefit accrues to the debtor. Right. If that makes sense. And 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 the 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 reality is, this is a choice. This is a policy decision. It, they, the category is financial repression. This is this is not some pie in the sky concept, but but when you combine financial repression with inflation, you begin to see that that money 
And interest rates have uh, a very critical impact in, in, in not only policy decisions, but being at the receiving end as, as a citizen. Your cash balance is, is not a neutral position, it may not even be a safe position. It may be subject to multiple forms of extraction, right? So we're used to taxation, right? We're used to taxation in the form of, you know, our treasury department requiring us to pay X amount out of income or out of capital gains from investments or things like that. But what about the other forms of extraction? Inflation is another form of taxation, but so is financial repression, where again, extraction of value from savings, the net effect is the same. You have less at the end of the day and someone else has more. Why do I tie this into digital currencies? Because it's much easier to affect financial repression when you have a system that is a closed system. And that's essentially what you end up with, a, a central bank digital currency system. It's a closed system that you, you can't operate outside of. So um, imagine that your cash deposits are at the local bank and they're now in an all digital format. Right. and as a policymaker, I want to incentivize an increase in spending. Right? Mm -hmm. We we had the social suggestion of this after 9-11 in the United States. Um, President Bush said, we need you to do your patriotic duty and we need you to spend. What he was recognizing is, is that our economy in the United States is 70% based on consumption. And if we were to respond in fear to a terror act and not spend, tighten our belts, we could see a collapse in the US economy. So his encouragement was go out there and spend some money, go buy a burger, mm. buy a new car, buy a VHS or DVD, just spend some money to keep the gears of, of, of the US economy churning. We need consumption to continue. Don't be afraid, get out there and spend. But what if you could incentivize sending? either with a carrot or a stick. This is where the digital currency comes in. I'm going to give you a sell-by date on every dollar deposit that you have at the local bank. If you have a full dollar's value and it'll buy a dollar's value if you spend it today. If you wait a month, it'll, it'll buy 98 cents. If you wait a year, it'll buy 90 cents. You, 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 can, you can literally calibrate a, a new form of inflation where your, your dollars in savings form will buy less and less over time. Why is this realistic and, 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 and not something that, that is um, you know, outside of, of, of a theoretical framework that already exists? John Maynard Keynes is probably the most influential economist in the 20th century. Uh, he may be the most influential economist in the 21st century as well. His concepts have defined the way that policymakers think and act. And one of his most famous concepts was the destruction of the rentier class. He did not want to see individuals with savings outside of the economy. He thought that was useless. Now, he operated very inconsistently with that. He was an investor. He was a saver. But he didn't think the whole system would work if you had people with an ability to take money out of the system. The right? only allows, savings. Only allowing certain people to have that benefit, right? It's uh, That's right. It goes on top again. Yeah. So, so this, this concept of central bank digital currencies, it allows for a, a Keynesian concept of, of doing away with savings or penalizing savings, hmm. taking money out of the economy to have capital set aside for some future investment. He wants it all in, all now. It needs to be in the economy, churning over and over and over. The, the economy will be most robust, according to the Keynesian concept, if you have every dollar in the economy, so how do you incentivize that? Central bank digital currencies allow you to incentivize. In this case, it's with a stick more than a carrot. You'll have more of your purchasing power available to you today than you will tomorrow. That, that's a long form answer yeah. to you know, sort of the digital currencies. We're interested in them primarily as, as speculative vehicles. I say we loosely, but the popularity of them today really ties to, can we make a bunch of money as quickly as possible? It's really not on the bona fides of, of uh, a, a, a currency system. Mm -hmm. And I think if, if you forget the nature of power and, and what our policymakers must have to implement what they want in terms of monetary policy, we're not moving towards uh, decentralization. As appealing as that may be, 
we're moving towards greater centralization and a loss of freedom. I was reading up recently about the idea that you can program the digital currency. And and that's kind of part of what you're saying, right? So that, you know, if you have that money now, it's worth X, but you keep it later, it's going to be worth Y. But some have suggested that perhaps there might be some uh, particular industries that government wants you to spend the money on. So, you know, so that becomes an issue. People want to uh, push you towards buying a particular um, vehicles as opposed to other vehicles, you know, electric vehicles versus internal combustion. And so, so government then would have greater ability to do that to you. And I mean, that, that strikes me as a big problem. There's some really fascinating steps forward with digital currencies, the, the attachment of smart contracts, um, sort of an embedded ability to have escrow accounts and, and things that today require, you know, think of, a, think of a real estate transaction. You have to have a third party in the middle, making sure that money comes in, money goes out, a transaction is is settled, but only after a certain number of papers have been filed, right? These are this is what we you can embed all of that in in a smart contract within a digital currency. This is a, a major step forward. So not suggesting that there's not some benefits, but 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 there's also trade-offs, benefits and drawbacks. I mean, they're, they're, seeing things from both perspectives is, I think healthy. And imagine we talked about the the, the, the stick, uh, the, the, the punishment and, and the incentivization of spending now versus later. You could also incentivize with a carrot and, and that would be an approved vendor. Your money goes further. You know, if you want to buy uh, an electric car, every dollar that you have to spend is worth a dollar ten. And and so you you could exactly program in uh, both the benefits and the drawbacks. And, and what you're basically doing is, and this is what Carmen Reinhart described in her program, you're corralling investors. And, and imagine a bunch of cattle corralled and then guided. Mm. Where do we go? We want you to make choice A or B. Another guest that I had on our, our commentary some years ago was Richard Bookstaver. Richard managed risk for um, Solomon Brothers back in the day. And, and then he was hired by the U.S. government to help draft the Dodd-Frank. Um, this is after the global financial crisis. We put together a, a massive piece of legislation to deal with financial regulation. And, and that was Dodd-Frank. He was involved in, in, in crafting that. His, his most recent book describes a better way forward. And it basically is this notion of, of corralling choice, limiting choice. Mm. If, if I said to you, on the basis of big data, I understand what your behavioral patterns are and I know what your preferences are. And on that basis, I'm, I'm going to project forward. I'm going to use technology to my benefit and say, I know what you might do. And on the basis of that, I'm going to limit your choices and give you A, B, and C, knowing that you're most likely to choose A, given what I know of your search history, of your purchases on Amazon, of all of these things aggregated by big data. And, and instead of having a whole world of choices open to you, I'm going to give you A, B, and C with probabilities being that you'll choose A. And, and that kind of corralling of consumer choices, that corralling of investor choices is the future. Why? Because governments want more control, not less. And, and you can date this back to the Epic of Gilgamesh and, and thousands and thousands of years ago, where people have conceived of utopias, a better world being one that is formalized and controlled, and, and not controlled in a bad way, but just beautified. Mm. There, there's, 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 a, there's a system in a city which is more appealing than the chaos of the wilds outside of the city. It, you, what happens outside the city gates? Oh, all kinds of things that are out of, outside of your control. Nature is, is a severe beast you can't tame. Right. But inside the city, we can control and, and create a better world. What, what Bookstaber argues in his book, the, the End of Theory, which is basically, we don't need an economic theory anymore to describe human behavior. We will dictate what human behavior looks like Generously, of course. Generously, of course. 
But it basically is harnessing the fallacy of false alternative. You can do A or you can do B. And we know what you're going to choose on the basis of all that we know about you already. So th this is the wor sort of dystopian world where I see digital currencies playing a critical role. And it's not a world of greater freedom. Yeah. Not as you and I understand freedom. Okay, so so this this really now causes us to be thinking about what we ought to be doing to protect ourselves with this new age that's coming, uh, that's really upon us now. And what advice do you give people? When you look at freedom, when you look at autonomy, it, it's it's about having a certain number of options. You know that you're not limited to just one choice. And so the exercise of freedom is, is you're saying, this is my preference of, of, of everything that's out there. That, so how do, you, how do you maintain a system of preferences? How do you maintain a system of, 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 of autonomy um, when, when choices are, are more and more limited? Um, I think the first thing that you can consider as, as an individual, as an investor, is, is the variety of vehicles that you use for the resources that you have. A part of my perspective here is is limited to resources and 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 the and the money aspect because that's the business that we're in that's that's the way we tend to think, but but keep in mind like what happened in Canada with uh, the instance of, of 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 truckers and protests and there was there was an immediate attack on money right Be because if you don't have resources all of a sudden your options are very limited. Where do you go? How do you operate? What choices can you actually affect without resources in play, right? So a, a part of it is a very practical aspect. It's not just sort of a limitation in scope. We could, we could have a philosophical discussion of freedom and, 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 and things of that nature. But when it comes to policies, when it comes to the limitations of freedom, you can see this right now with the U.S. Treasury Department uh, squeezing the Russians on the Ukraine issue and, and it's a limitation of the flow of funds that all of a sudden shrinks their universe of, of options, right? So this is, this is very important to think about. So for me, the vehicles that you, you hold money in are important. Does that mean having uh, some cash uh, literally in your possession? Yes. Does that mean you need to create a massive hoard of, of, of you know, Canadian dollars, US dollars? No, I don't think so. But adequate for a month's re, you know, needs, I think that's reasonable. Um, so the vehicles might be actual physical cash, uh, might be uh, gold and silver in your possession, might be gold and silver in different geographies, might be various forms of accounts, um, whether that's a savings account, a banking account, an investment account with multiple institutions. And, and I think it's, it's important to think about a difference of geography. So, mm -hmm. so for a, a U.S. person, thinking about having a, a financial footprint in Canada, having a financial footprint in Singapore or, or London or, or Zurich. Um, this is something that allows you to have resources that are beyond the reach of government. And I, I love our country. I love our government, generally speaking. Um, I recognize that it's highly dysfunctional in many respects, but I also recognize the tendency of, 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 of humans. And if I look at history, I think this is where some of my skepticism of government comes in. We don't know who the government is tomorrow. We don't know if, if they are operating in our best interest or their best interest tomorrow. And so a part of being skeptical and thinking in terms of even having different geographical um, sources for your resources is because you don't know what tomorrow holds. And, and I see this very frequently uh, with, with families in Europe wanting a financial footprint in the United States, with U.S. investors wanting a financial footprint in Europe or in Canada. So having varied geographies is, is certainly one way of sort of keeping your options open. And um, that can be very complicated or not complicated at all. We've tried to make it very simple for U.S. persons, uh, you know, with with like our vaulted program. Uh, you can use an online app to have gold storage in Canada, right? So for the U.S. person, this is great. It's it's in Ottawa, um, and it's it's in another geography. We have similar programs that tie to Switzerland and in the U.S. And so that's just a different way of thinking about things. But but if you're uh, 
a student of history, you can see some of the wealthiest families in the world have looked at the change in political regimes as as the trigger for wealth destruction and mm-hmm. and, and and resource compression. So it's very common if if I were living in Europe to have a bank account in London. I mean that happened constantly. If you if you're looking at Austria and Germany and the history of World War uh, One and Two, you can see that people kept their options open and were glad to have had those options open. I spent the week this last week with with a number of of, of thinkers um, in in Texas uh, at a conference and met a gal who was uh, from Poland and her family had to leave the country mm-hmm. and they were able to leave with jewelry and a small amount of gold in their possession. And that was it. That's what they had. Freedom comes in many forms. And this is something that that conceptually we think about and, and talk about a lot. Um, freedom of movement, freedom of speech, um, freedom to operate and choose the, the, the what we consider to be our greatest good or, or, or representation of human flourishing. Mm-hmm. And, and so it, what enables freedom, many of those expressions of freedom, um, isn't in many respects resources. So having a diversification of resources and having a diversification of locations for those resources may be a new concept for your listeners, but I think an important one. One of the things that happened as a result of the uh, government seizing bank accounts in Canada is that a number of people have been withdrawing money from the banks and um, they have been basically hoarding the cash. And And I, I get a little concerned for them because I'm like, okay, but if someone breaks in, uh, then then what happens? Uh, you know, or if you if you have gold in in your possession, what happens when people break into your home? That kind of thing. But what you're saying is, look, um, have it in different places. When you have different bank accounts, even if you have uh, bank accounts overseas, the government, certainly the government of Canada expects you to disclose everything. Uh, so mm-hmm. it's like, you know, are, are you much further ahead uh, by having, uh, you know, those other bank accounts? You're a little further ahead. It, it, there, there is no perfect solution, and I think what you're describing is is trade-offs, mm-hmm. where you know if you take money out of the system, now you you have this new trade-off, a risk uh, there in your home. Um, so we described financial repression earlier. Right. Money in the system has a certain form of risk. Inflation is a certain form of risk where we're being robbed. Maybe it's two percent a year right now in the U.S. It's seven point nine percent a year. So it's 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 a little bit. They're digging a little bit deeper into our pockets, mm-hmm. and we used to ignore it. And, and it does get to a point where you say, "What options should I consider? What are the trade-offs? If I just stay in the banking system, this isn't helping me. And right. frankly, if you just move out of a bank account and have cash in hand, it's not saving you any of the pressures from inflation, right? right. So, you know, this is there is no perfect. Uh, world, no perfect solution. But you look at the the variety of options that you have, consider the trade-offs, and just make sure that you have enough to work with. I'm not much of a golfer, to be honest with you. Um, but I do know that no one goes to the golf course with a single club. Right. He, you, you have a variety in the bag, and they all serve a purpose, and they're all disadvantaged. Like You would never take a driver uh, onto the putting green. Mm. It, it's just not the right tool for the job. It's it's very disadvantaged. Mm. So you you look at, at at a variety of circumstances, and then make sure you've got as many tools as possible, as many clubs in the bag as you can possibly get. I mean that makes a lot of sense, and um, you just have to, I guess, be very uh, disciplined and keeping track of where, you, uh, what you have, where you have it, and that kind of thing. I've often been amazed what you mentioned about diamonds. Um, I've been, been amazed that, um, as I understand it, I remember seeing a documentary one time in New York City or about New York City in the diamond trade. And oftentimes these people are making deals with a handshake. And sometimes it could be hundreds of thousands of dollars in the value of the diamond. And then when I got into some research on the concept of these, uh, oftentimes 
people who have been persecuted in other countries came over to New York uh, City, um, but they were able to carry their wealth in their pocket because they had converted everything they owned to diamonds and brought it over. Uh, but then they got into the diamond trade and, you know, obviously was able to um, sell it and monetize it. I, I guess as we are moving towards in, in many respects, like what we saw here in Canada, it's important for people to not overreact to the point where they don't get some uh, proper advice as to what they ought to be doing with their finances. Because as we talked, you know, like, what do you do if you're, you know, you got everything in the house, your house gets broken in, then, then you're sunk. So then the, the idea or the, the concept that I'm hearing from you is okay. Diversify, get, get your different golf clubs. And um, how, how can people who've never, ever even thought of this, what can they do? Who like, I mean, obviously your organization is helping people uh, do this, correct? I, I mean, 50 years of trying to solve problems. And some of those are practical problems, like if I want to retire at time X, what kind of resources do I need to be able to do that? Right. Um, and those are life cycle problems. Uh, what we have is political cycle problems layered on top of life cycle problems. So some of the things that we want to solve for as individuals, um, perhaps wanting to leave a legacy to our children or grandchildren, you know, we have to think in terms of uh, how these other layers get put on top, um, public policy choices, monetary policy choices that can end up pressuring our own personal financial goals. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of what we do in, the, in, in our weekly podcast, Barry, is, is just to help people understand what they're dealing with in terms of this multi-layered uh, world. So, and, and the best decisions that they can make. Mm -hmm. So, you know, making decisions in fear, I don't think is a very good thing to do, mainly because the quality of decision is, is sort of connected to the degree of fear involved. What I like to do is, is imagine a, an array of, of, of scenarios and in a dispassionate removed setting, Mm -hmm. Look at the options that I want open in each of those scenarios and then begin to make choices as to the best course of action in those various scenarios. So scenario analysis is 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 helpful, can't even be entertaining. And and it's not based on fear. It's it's based on reasonable outcomes, reasonable expectations, probabilities, and the best plans that can be put in place before a moment of crisis. This is something that we do in relation to the financial markets. You know, today, the Dow, the S&P, the NASDAQ, the, the Russell 2000, you know, look at the Toronto Exchange, you know, the, these are indices that are within 10% of all-time highs. Right. If we went into something like the global financial crisis all over again, uh, let's say we were 30, 40, 50% lower in value, what was your game plan? Did you have a game plan? Did you do scenario analysis or are you in that position where on the basis of compressed values, now you've seen a significant capital loss, are you in the mode of, of panic? And, 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 and this is where forethought is of such great value. Mm. Where fear is not the dominant theme, it's just practical, pragmatic. Um, what are the best decisions if our circumstances change? And can we rehearse some of that ahead of time such that as the circumstances change, it's kind of business as usual. We've already rehearsed this. We know what we're, we're going to do. Mm -hmm. and, and we're operating, even though we may feel tension inside given new circumstances, whether that's a political environment that's, that's not helpful, healthy, or what have you, uh, or a financial market environment that is equally stressed and strained your best choices are made before the moment of crisis. Let me just bring up another issue that is getting some, some play recently, and that is the UBI, the universal basic income concept. Currently right now, there is a uh, piece of legislation in the Canadian Senate. Um, I don't know how far, I wonder sometimes if government is just kind of um, setting up these trial balloons just to see what kind of response people will have with respect to it. We are hearing more about this idea that the government is going to provide funding to people, you know, regardless if you work or not. And have you noticed any kind of traction with this idea in government? And why is it so attractive to government? 
I think a part of the reason it's so attractive is because you're talking about creating an entirely vassal state. I mean, if if there is a high dependency on the government, um, in in theory, there's also a greater degree of gratitude uh, and, and and a greater degree of compliance with the wishes and whims of government. So so who butters my bread? Mm, yes. <laughs> And and what happens if I don't comply? What if I don't obey? What what if I'm not on board with policy X, Y, and Z? Oh well, you don't qualify for your income anymore. So dependencies are something that you know you think oh it's just a gift, gift with strings attached is is I think the better way of of, of viewing it. Hmm. What is at stake, Barry? Is 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 graver than just those aspects of of, of control? We experience a part of our humanity in what we do, who we are, our identity. I mean, if you look at, 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 at social constructs, the family is this fascinating social construct that, that out of which comes an understanding of who we are, right, uh, right. our place in history, right. um, who we are as a family, who we are as a people. And, and, and that's really critical. But work is is one of those things that also factors into our understanding of dignity and self-worth. I don't know if it's an unintended consequence or an intended consequence, but theoretically, one of the consequences of UBI is that who determines identity um, becomes it's just it that 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 shifts more to the state as opposed to what do I do? I'm a lawyer, i'm I'm a doctor, I'm a teacher. Um, I'm a trucker. Do you know, I love seeing what I saw up in Canada because because you're talking about a class of workers that is so underappreciated, so underappreciated. I mean, we we don't operate with the things that we consider to be normal. We groceries show up, right? The products that we need at 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 an auto repair store, they're always there. No, Mm. they're not. They have to be moved from point A to point B. And, and this linchpin of society, which, which is never really considered and honored and appreciated, just raised their hand and said, we have an opinion and yeah. we just want you to know we're, we're a subset of society and we matter too. Yeah. And, and they, yeah. they do. Yeah. So, but, but every aspect, every role in society is critical and and the way that we are designed, I'll say this um, presumptively as 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 a as a Christ follower, as as a, as a Christian, um, we're designed with certain skills that are unique to each one of us. Mm. We have gifts to give and an impact which is unique, just like our fingerprint is unique. Mine is different than yours, is different than ever, anyone else's, mm. and 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 the universe in its beauty is best manifest by individuals expressing their God-given talents and gifts. What happens when you begin to strip away the value that an individual contributes to society and say, no, you can sit on the couch and play video games. You can do whatever you want. Whatever your greatest bliss is, pursue that on your own terms. We're just going to pay you for being you. We, We lose what our what our contribution is that that work is valuable and we express a part of who we are through the work of our hands mm. so so i think there's a lot at stake with ubi universal basic income where you're basically paid to do nothing or paid to do whatever you want to do i'm going to go to the park and take pictures well that's great but the the the, the notion of avocation and vocation the difference between the two avocations are wonderful i have many avocations mm-hmm. But I also derive a tremendous amount of purpose in life from my vocation. Yeah. Right. So to strip that away is is to undermine some something very basic in our psychology. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think if you're undermining collective psychology, you're creating a variety of psychoses, which we can't even calculate at this point. Right. But that you're experimenting with some really big things. This is not purely economics. This is not purely economics, although I think the economics is atrocious. I think the social consequences of UBI are are even more grave as you look at the diminishment of humanity. Mm-hmm. And maybe, maybe that's too dramatic, but that's the way I see you it. Know, I, I think you're on to it exactly because you look at the last two years here in Canada where 
Um, they had the government had CERB funding. I forget what that all stands for, but the idea was you stay you stay home from work because of COVID, and I and the government is going to pay you to stay home. And so for two years, we've had uh, situations. My wife is a piano teacher, and so students are not in school. They're not uh, doing their regular routine. They've got tons of free time. And guess where they go? They go to the video games. Well, even though they have lots of time, they had less time doing their piano practice during the week. And as a result, uh, there was a real, real change in the ability of the students to keep up with something as basic as piano. To, to me, in, in many ways, I think our COVID experience right. should help us think about these much bigger issues uh, if we're going to go UBI. You see it with a listlessness with kids where you know they may get exactly what they want. I've, I've got kids 15, 13, 10, 8. Uh, they love video games. I, mm -hmm. I can appreciate that. You know, and, and I hate video games, mm -hmm. Ex except that when they ask me when I grew up, was I playing video games? And I say, yeah, you know, in fact, if you put me in front of a Galaga game today, I could spend an hour or two playing that because I really do like it. But I hate it at the same time because I realize that it's 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 like a, a, a black hole for my humanity. Right. I can disappear into this world of um, brain chemical stimulation. Mm -hmm. which is artificial in nature, but highly rewarding, except it ties out to nothing in terms of like a life pursuit or something of greater purpose. I mean, these are basic beliefs and worldview beliefs, mm -hmm. but one of my basic beliefs and worldview beliefs is, is that we are made with and for purpose. Right. And to the degree that we are not living with purpose or something, you know, towards something of, of, of greater purpose, I think a part of our souls diminish, they, they, they wither, they, they, you know, and I think that's, that's what we're seeing when you reference COVID, what we're talking about is a growth and mental health issues, because there's certain developmental things that have to happen that only happen in the context of society. They, they only happen in the context of, of problem solving that only happen in the context of, of, of conflict and conflict resolution, things that happen at work, at school, in an engaged world. And again, UBI is just one of those things that says, no, we think everyone's going to be happier if they can do what they want to do. Instead of us working, we allow government to pay us just to live and w without a without that deeper inner sense and understanding of why we are here and what our purpose is and our identity. I, I love that. That's that's so powerful. You have you've hit the nail right on the head. And it's it's one of the things that we uh, you know, we think of Kissinger, who said, you know, control food, control people. And and in many ways, yeah. that's what we we got here. But at, at the end of the day, it's diabolical, it seems to me, because we, we are destroying who we are. And I think I think I, I had a conversation the other night uh, with a professor in Ottawa. And we talked about telos and techne and and the Greeks mm -hmm. understood that um it's not it's not just being able to do something. It's understanding, knowing why you do something, the telos, right? The purpose. Right. And um, we we have been losing that understanding uh, in our society, it seems to me, that we're just considered only about the doing. We don't even know why we're doing it, but we're doing it because it feels good, because it's whatever. Um, and it's that greater purpose. And I think that's what ultimately is destroyed with the UBI. Just that notion of identity is, is I think, really important because we've, we've determined that, that we're no longer bound by um, biology. We're, we're, we've determined right. that we're no longer bound. So, so we're, we're already experimenting with what identity is. And, and yeah. UBI seems to be sort of this this governmental approach to saying ultimately we're going to tell you who you are again because we you lose you lose the sense of who you are in not having a greater purpose mm -hmm. and then i think it becomes much easier for government to say let, let us help you understand who you are yeah. and so so now it's no longer a sheerly 
a, a, a subjective expression, mm. but, but, but it becomes something that can be determined by the state. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with that. And perhaps that's kind of a slippery slope argument. Um, well, but I'm, but I'm uncomfortable with it. You, you know what? The slippery slope argument is often used uh, in the practice of law where uh, the courts make reference to that. But uh, I've had a chance to go back and look at some of those cases. And I've seen that that actual claim for slippery slope is in fact what happens. You know, we've seen it over and over again. You, you, you know, especially when you're dealing with the moral issues. For example, uh, we had a situation in Canada with uh, medical assistance in dying. It used to be mad. It used to be medical assistance in death, or some, or medical assistance in dying or death. Yeah, it, it used to be mad. Now they go made. Uh, but uh, the the idea here was that, oh, you know, we are not going to uh, allow this to get out of hand. And people who have mental issues, that, that won't be the, the, the kind of uh, people that we will allow to have a physician, a system in death. And then lo and behold, only a couple of years after the decision, we get a de another court decision that does allow the very thing that the court said years be before would not happen here in Canada because we're so different than Europe. For example, the court said, uh, you know, we're not going to be like Belgium. We've got lots of checks and balances in Canada. And then lo and behold, well, no, actually, uh, we get that slippery slope. So it seems that to me, anyhow, the slippery slope is is a very good argument. I, I want to move on a little bit to to the whole issue of trust with respect to government. How is it, you know, when it comes to finances, as you mentioned here in our discussion already, you, 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 you outlined that public policy decisions are intentional. Uh, the government is making a decision as to whether or not they're going to actually tax us, uh, where they'll, you know, we file our income tax returns, we pay our tax, or are they going to tax us through other policies, i.e. inflation? How do we as a people deal with this concept of trusting government when it comes to monetary policy. History would seem to me to be that we can't trust government. And it's it almost seems like we must have the assumption that government is not necessarily your best friend. While there are some governments better than others, the reality is we need to be having that defensive mindset, it would appear to me. Uh, because we don't know what's going to happen to our own financial situation based on government policy. And then how do we protect our families with respect to that? Now, it, maybe, if you, maybe, maybe I'm way off. Maybe I'm too uh, pessimistic when it comes to government. But Well, I think there's a continuum of, of government tied to scale where a small scale government, I think there's uh, greater opportunity for trust as as there's benefits to government serving us versus us serving them. Right. There is a certain tipping point where on the basis of scale, uh, sort of the, 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 the description of the Leviathan, mm. the size and scale and scope, all of a sudden, the system is serving itself versus serving the people. Right. And, and so you see very circular and self-interested policies put in place that sort of perpetuate government as it is and the further growth of government, whether that's good for the people or not, is, is almost a secondary consideration. Mm. Um, so I do think that as the scale of government grows, accountability becomes more difficult. And, and, and to the degree that accountability becomes difficult, you are looking at a, at a situation where uh, the individual not necessarily represented in government has every reason to be suspicious because your interests may not be aligned with sort of a governmental um, direction. Right. right? So I, th this is, yeah, I, I, th I think that's the challenge is, is how do we then impact government? How do we and certainly participating as a voter is important. You know, we still have the ability to speak and speak loudly. We should. That's not a, a right that is necessarily going to be there forever. Mm -hmm. And so creating channels of communication that that may give us a voice for a longer period of time, I think that's also uh, an imperative um, 
to to deter, to make sure that you know a, a univocal narrative um, doesn't doesn't keep us from from having some sort of voice in the public sphere. I mean, you see this in China already, where if if you have the wrong opinions, and the difference between right opinions and wrong opinions is how closely they're aligned with the Politburo's direction of of, of what is ideal for all in China. Right. And and so you know, and now you're measured. You're measured by your compliance with and complementarity to the state's objectives, and you get sesame credits. You're you're a good boy today. You get extra sesame credits. You're a bad boy. You said the wrong thing on Twitter or whatever. You get demark demarcations there. This is an issue for us to consider. How do we continue to maintain voice? How do we continue to maintain uh, representation in government? Mm-hmm. Um, it does mean that at some point we have to come out of our shells. So many times people want to just kind of do their own thing. Let, let me, let me just enjoy the privileges and freedoms that I, that I have. Leave me alone to live my life as I see fit. Mm. Sometimes that disengagement with government and disengagement from the public sphere means that someone else is in the public sphere making all the decisions. And it may not always be the case that we get to just enjoy life as it is. So, so there is some engagement we have to be a part of in the public sphere and in politics directly. Otherwise, you can you you can be assured you'll have no voice, you'll have no power, you you will be in a, in a minority in many respects. One of the things that we talk about in our first freedoms is the idea of freedom of speech. We get our name from a, from a case in 1953, freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, and violability of the person. And those those are the first freedoms that we as an organization advocate. And it seems to me that even here on the monetary policy as well, because our finances are so linked with our freedom, having the ability to be able to speak when we see our freedom being challenged uh, by government is uh, so important. And while we have uh, at least the uh, semblance of a representative democracy at this point, we need to be uh, willing to speak out. And even if that means we are going to be challenged on social media or challenged, you know, because not everyone's going to agree with us, right? Engaging in the public sphere and, and, and engaging in a conversation about public policy issues or monetary policy issues, it is easy to get um, bombastic and agitated. Uh, and, and, and I think to, to maintain a voice today, it needs to be a reasonable voice. It needs mm-hmm. to be a, a well thought out voice. It needs to be a well informed voice. It doesn't have to be um, polarizing, um, to be truth laden. And, you know, on this issue of monetary policy and, and, and freedom, we have every reason to not trust our central banks with the value of our money here in the United States, the creation of the federal reserve was 1913 from that point till now, uh, following their prime mandate of, of price stability, Mm-hmm. We've lost 97, 98% of the purchasing power of the dollar. Their record is abysmal. Mm-hmm. There is no reason for confidence and trust. And, and, and that's, that's on a long time frame. If you looked at the current um, monetary policy implementation, 600 PhDs at the Federal Reserve, our central bank, determined that there would be no inflation because they were in control of the economy and and, yeah. and because they understood the nuances of supply chains and and reopening post covid the reality is a phd does not guarantee common sense and it does not guarantee that you're tied into any semblance of real world reality That's conceptually right. there may be value and 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 an expression of pure genius mm-hmm. but in the real world where the rubber meets the road it can be very different and that's what we're experiencing today so trust and confidence in the central bank community is waning quickly and i'll tell you one of the things that holds together monetary stability if you want to look at the canadian dollar the the, the bank of japan is a classic case in point this week you're talking about a multi decade low in the yen because they just promised again to guarantee pricing in the bond market. They're going to buy trillions uh, in bonds okay. to guarantee a price and to set the interest rate. The immediate reflection of that in the currency markets is the Japanese yen takes another nosedive and is, and is at multi-decade lows. So, so the currency is an indicator 
of the confidence that people have in their central bank. So you you raise this issue of trust. That's mm-hmm. what we've seen chipped away at. And fr- frankly, I think you look at the, the multi-decade move higher in gold from $300 an ounce to $2,000 an ounce from, from the year 2000 to present. And yep. that actually is what is being reflected. A, 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 a loss of confidence and a loss of trust in, in, in the PhD standard is we moved from the gold standard to the PhD standard a long time ago. And yeah. now confidence in those authoritative figures is waning. My best advice in terms of a loss of that, that loss of trust and confidence continuing to the point of there being a, a currency crisis mm-hmm. is that you can put yourself on your own gold standard, even if from a public policy standpoint, there's not a lot of movement towards that. So again, you may say, well, this is grossly self-interested. Of course, he's got that advice. He's been in the gold business for five decades. I'm talking about the history of money. Right. And the history of money is that gold was money. I should be out of business. And the day that we move back to the gold standard, I am out of business because you don't need me. Right. Now you're talking about sound money, something that has something real backing it. Today, all you have is the weight of those PhDs, their ideas, the ability of the federal government to tax. I mean, these are the only things that represent pillars supporting our currency. Mm. And I think actually you're going to see a good bit of currency crisis on a global basis over the next few years. So putting yourself on your own gold standard, it's not an expression of trust. It's an extension of trend. Mm. And, And as this trend continues in terms of loss of confidence in the currency markets, your savings are at risk. Right. And to the degree that you lose your savings through no fault of your own, mm-hmm. you are in a position of greater dependency on the state. And that's, again, where I think whatever you can do, whether it's owning farmland and having the ability to, to, to create your own food, you know, chickens and a cow. I, I'm not a farmer, so I can't do this. I'm going to default to a few more ounces um, <laughs> and I'll buy your cow. Uh but th- this is this is the, this is the issue. The system is not going to take care of you. The system will take care of itself, and you are merely grist for the mill. If you can respect that, that the technocratic elite have more in mind their ideas, ideals, and best outcomes, and not necessarily something that is representative of your interests, mm-hmm. you ne- you need to operate with greater autonomy. You need to be making decisions that, again, if if the ideal is a gold standard for all, but we're not going to get that, what about the gold standard for you? Right. If the ideal is 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 free speech for all, and you're hoping the system takes care of that, what about your own community communication? How are you engaged at the local level such that you don't have to worry about Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and whether or not you're listed or delisted? Like, have you opened the dialogue such that you continue to have free speech just on a lower level, not not through modern technology, but you're engaged? And again, if the system is not supporting it, how do you do it on the micro level? Barry, so many of the things that I wrote about in The Intentional Legacy, it's a book I wrote in 2017 about family legacy. It has to do with that issue of telehealth. It has to do with the, the, the trajectory you're setting yourself on, whether it's the, the intellectual life of you, the individual, or uh, that dynamic within a home setting. It has to do with, with, with the emotional life of you or the family. What trajectory are you on? So many of these things are difficult to solve at the macro level, but are quite easy. And you are powerful and can do something at the micro level. Mm. And by the way, when I look at Michael Green's book, which which catalogs sort of the revolutionary nature of uh, the Christian church in the first century, mm-hmm. there was no big tent events. This was, this was one person caring about one person and investing in an individual's life through love and caring and compassion and generosity. And those dynamics had such a radical impact, one person to one person that there was a multiplication effect. And all of a sudden, something changed dynamically, not by focusing on macro issues, but by focusing on micro, right? So to me, when I look at legacy, I don't look at what you have at the end of your life. I care about the decisions that you are making today. And if we aggregate those individual decisions, now you're talking about the stuff of legacy, the expression of values, and whether the system supports it or is against it doesn't matter. 
because we know that human flourishing can take place in any context, whether it's a free society or a closed society, whether it's a society that promotes our deepest values or undermines them. And, and to the degree that we lose this connection with the value of our choices and the communities that we live in and cultivate, starting with the family, we can be very discouraged and, and, and lose sight of the fact that we can continue to flourish and may not get what we want. Right. Not at the macro. You know what? That is fantastic. In fact, I encourage our listeners, uh, if you just watch, you're watching us now, I, I encourage you to just rewind and listen to that again. That was powerful. You hit it right on the head. And, and it, it just shows you the importance of looking at our own individual choices. It, you reminded me as you were talking, I, re, I heard loud and clear Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Right. Live not by lies, you know, in your own sphere, he said, as he was leaving the Soviet Union because of exile, his message to his compatriots was simply this. Make sure that you say what you hold to be true, not what someone tells you to say. And you don't do anything. You don't go anywhere unless you want to go there. And and I think it's in those little decisions, those decisions that we make individually, we're able to make a much freer society. That's powerful. Love it. Well, thank you so much, David, for uh, being with us. It's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, it's so great to be able to meet you uh, through this uh, virtual <laughs> apparatus. And again, another wonderful, amazing thing of, of our society to be able to to, to do this, which helps us in our own pursuit of freedom. Barry, thank you. Thank you for caring about the issues that you do and, and giving a voice to them. Thank you for inviting others into a, a larger conversation uh, to develop a sensitivity to, to things that matter and, and, and to consider uh, their own telos uh, and, and the direction of, 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 of our culture uh, and, and the role that they can play in, in that. Um, you're an encouragement to many people, and, and I appreciate you um, applying some discipline to doing it on a routine basis, having this kind of conversation. Well, thank you. Thank you so very much. Listen, David, can you tell us, uh, for our viewers, where they're able to find more information about you? So the podcast is weeklycommentary.com. And that's a great resource if you are interested in a whole host of things. If of course, our focus is on the financial markets, but so many things factor into that, um, international relations and public politics and uh, sociology and psychology and so many things are, are fun to engage with at, 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 uh, in that venue. So weeklycommentary.com, uh, that savings program that I described for, for gold, mm -hmm. uh, you know, instead of dollars in the bank, uh, perhaps subject to financial repression at some point, certainly subject to inflation even now. Um, vaulted.com, vaulted.com. And our relationship with the Royal Canadian Mint is fantastic. Uh, I couldn't be more proud to be tied to uh, an organization that has history handling metals going back to 1908, 1909, 1911, when British sovereigns were, were minted as coin of the realm, as gold money. Uh, we, we're working with, with that group out of Ottawa, and, and, and I'm glad that they have that legacy. I think those are two places, uh, vaulted.com or at, in the app store, uh, the weekly commentary. We have lots of other things. If you go to McIlvaney.com or too many URLs to list. <laughs> okay. um, well, we'll but if you want to get to know us, I think the weekly commentary is a great way. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Well, folks, I want to thank you for taking the time to watch Freedom Feature here today. And uh, as we've always say, you know, you may not always agree with either what we share or what our guests share. But the whole purpose of this organization as First Freedoms is to allow us to engage in meaningful dialogue on things that matter. Freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, the inviolability of the person. These are issues that are here and now. And until next time, I'm Barry Bussey. The fight for freedom consists not only in the legal battles in court, but also in the battle of ideas at the universities and in the media. It takes time, effort, and money to keep on top of the debates for freedom. Your donation allows us to keep fighting for all Canadians. First Freedoms. 
www.thepowerhouse.ca.